Welcome back to Morbidly Bewitched. I am super excited. Stay tuned because this is going to be one of my favorite episodes. So if you haven't already, please subscribe. And in this episode, I will be discussing the doomed Franklin expedition. In 1845, it was 19th of May, these two ships, Her Majesty's ships, Erebus and Terror, left the Thames of England, hoping to find that elusive Northwest Passage that still had not been obtained. Headed by the God-fearing Captain Sir John Franklin, a 59-year-old veteran of the sea, and his second-in-command, Captain Francis Crozier of the Terror, a hardened, whiskey-loving Irishman, along with a crew of 120 officers, they were steadfast, hardy, and confident. The two ships themselves were originally bomber ships, and that's why they were picked for this voyage. But they received high-tech adjustments that were feet of engineering for the day. So they boasted these solid, thick oak beams that supported their hulls. But not only this, they had reinforced external beams, and then they had reinforced uh, iron cladding for these hulls to turn them into unstoppable icebreakers. They boasted the very first version of central heating. It came off the pipes and it ran from these big massive stoves and the steam engines themselves along the pipes and through the entire ships which kept it to a temperature fit for a lounge cat. Well, to you and I, above freezing. But whenever these teams were out in the Arctic Ocean, above freezing within a, a ship back in 1845 would have felt almost stiflingly hot. These huge um, stoves would have been used approximately 22 hours a day on both ships by the onboard cooks. Yep, they didn't have it easy either because they were permanently cooking bread and biscuits and all sorts of things for these men, 128 crew. They had themselves put in place enough provisions to last them for a full three years at sea and a further five if they cut that down to rations with over 32,000 tons of preserved meats and gallons and gallons of lemon juice to try and ward off that dreaded scurvy. Not only were the ships ridiculously advanced, they also had on board a brand new idea in the food industry, tins, which meant that they could pack copious amounts of foodstuffs that would have longer expiry dates, including tantalizing flavors like liver and steak and stew. It was all, to these guys, it just sounded delicious. All sounds pretty amazing, doesn't it? The ships, the food, the crew themselves. No. What lay ahead of these two ships and their men was unthinkable, unimaginable torture. The two large vessels were last seen just off Baffin Bay by a British whaling boat I'm never seen again. It was Sir John Franklin's wife, Lady Jane Franklin, and her sheer tenacity that got them to start launching search parties for the men because no word had been sent back from anywhere. It wasn't until 1854 when a Scottish explorer, John Ray, came across an Inuit tribe in the area who started describing things to him that would have sent shivers up your spine. Like um, the description of dying men trying to make their way across these barren stretches of land. 
It was the final search party they were prepared to send out in 1859, headed by a Captain Francis Leopold McClintock, before they would reach King William Island and start to see signs of the two lost ships. They seen remnants from empty hulls of lifeboats to empty tins strewn about the land, almost as if a group of men had tried to make their way across. Among these artifacts were many notes that they came across that had been written along the way by crew members. And they were in most parts the ramblings of mad men. They were written sometimes backwards and sometimes in codes that had to be deciphered. But within these notes, they were able to piece together roughly what had happened. It turned out that they were only into their voyage about a year whenever they became ice locked. Now, I have a diagram. If you can imagine, that this is the waterways, the beige bits, the waterways, and then this, the black bits are all land. So here is uh, King William Island. Now the two boats, this is Erebus. They are not to scale. If they were to scale, they would be able to plow through the land, let alone ice. They came down, this is Victoria Strait. They came down Victoria Strait and they became completely ice locked roughly about here. Now that is Erebus. I need to bring you Terror. Her slightly smaller. There she is. So they became completely ice locked in around here somewhere. They remained that way for 18 months before they decided to abandon their two ships. They had ample provisions. 18 months in was an extremely lengthy uh, amount of time, but they had plenty of food, they had plenty of fluids. They even had these um, advanced tanks above the stoves that could convert snow into drinking water. Among the notes, they realized that their beloved captain, Sir John Franklin, had died on the 11th of June, 1847, um, which would have been a real morale uh, drop for all of the team. Whenever back then in particular, the captain of the ship was God. So they got off the two ladies and started making their way to King William Island. So they were completely ice locked. The thing is, whenever you have pack ice, pack ice is as it suggests, it, it's a pack, but anything that gets attached to the pack will travel with the pack. They were crushed by the ice. The ice is an unbelievable force and it was crushing the ships to atoms. But the both ladies had been swallowed by the black Arctic sea and were no longer there which meant McClintock's um, rescue team only the only people they had to speak to about the entire incident were local Inuit people. One old Eskimo woman told McClintock that what she witnessed was men walking while they were dying, fallen as they walked, walking dead men, campsites with provisions strewn all around them and spoiled foods from tins lying about the men's feet as well. But then they also started describing another scene that would shock McClintock. It was the scene of cannibalism. They described seeing bones in buckets and that the bones themselves had striation marks on them as all, it was almost as if to show that a sharp knife had cut the flesh from the bones to remove it. They were it. When McClintock returned with this news, the admirals were not prepared. This was complete snobbery back then, but not prepared to believe for one minute that civilized, well-bred Englishmen would stoop to such levels. And they turned it around on the Inuit people themselves saying, these people, these savage people probably murdered our crews and our men and ate them because they would not do it to each other. 
The entire Franklin expedition went down in history as an unsolved mystery. These men and the vessels that they went out in, the Erebus and the Terror, vanished into the Arctic fog. The deaths of the men that abandoned the ship were put down by the admirals as the savagery of the Inuit tribes and the locals having attacked, murdered and probably eaten the men. It would not be until the 20th century that um, our own advancement in technology and research would shine some kind of light on the Franklin expedition and what happened to all of the men. Because you see, the expedition left behind three little well-parceled gifts. Bodies. Yep. In the infancy of the trip itself, three bodies from the Franklin expedition were buried on Beachy Island. Probably whenever the crew were in good enough spirits and reasonable health. And these bodies would tell a tale. Because the Franklin Expedition is one of my favourites and there is so much to it that I absolutely adore, I'm going to make this a trilogy. This is the two ships heading out and their journey. Now we've came to the part where the crew has vanished, the ships have vanished, and there's only horrible remnants of men trying to survive across King William Island. In my next video, I take you to the bodies of Beachy Island. I will see you soon.